This is Peter Helland on Citizens for Community Media, and Dave Wemhoff uh, is here tonight, and uh, he wants to start with this uh, Mississippi case. Yeah, that is now scaring some people that it possibly has the potential with uh, Trump's three new appointees on the court. That's right. Uh, especially Amy Coney Barrett here locally, it has the potential of maybe uh, in 2022 when it gets there finally, of uh, overturning Roe versus Wade, which is like the scariest thing in the world for a lot of people. That's the big issue. I mean, a week ago, our life was going about, you know, ordinary day-to-day -day life. And then all of a sudden on Monday, we're, we hear over the media that Roe versus Wade is in trouble. Oh, boy, what happened in a week? Well, the U.S. Supreme Court decided to take up this Mississippi case. Uh, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, uh, which had been percolating up through the courts of appeal. It deals with the Mississippi's Gestational Age Act of 2018. And what that act says is basically it bans abortions with a couple of exceptions uh, for life of the mother, uh, and I think incest is the other one, but it, but it bans abortions uh, after 15 weeks. Well, that's the first trimester. Roe versus Wade held that, you know, after the first trimester, you know, the government has an increasingly greater um, interest in trying to ban abortions. Um, and so um, what we're hearing in the press now is that all of a sudden Roe versus Wade is under attack. It's under, it could be overturned. It could be, over, so everybody's getting energized, right? Everybody's getting energized. So I, it's it's kind of too early. This is Wednesday, right? This broke on Monday. So what I, I was able to do is get a, an article from the Wall Street Journal, and the Wall Street Journal said the Supreme Court said that it would address a single question, quote, whether all pre-viability prohibitions on elective abortions are unconstitutional, end of quote. Very, very narrow issue, right? It's not whether Roe versus Wade is is justified or not. It's just that very, very narrow issue. Uh, but this is what the media does in this country. It just kind of blows it up all, all out of proportion. And that is a violation of what? Intermerifica. Intermerifica says you're supposed to provide the right information. You're supposed to provide it in the proper manner uh, for the proper objective. And it applies to everybody. And, and inter, Intermerifica was possibly the, the most important document coming out of Vatican Two, I think and it, was it was the first one. Yeah, and it was the most suppressed one. Yeah, it, it was a decree. A decree is higher than a declaration. A decree, the decree of Intermerifica is higher than the Declaration of Dignitas Humanae. It's it's much higher. Um, and in that decree, it states in paragraph six that all are subject to the moral law, all. And then it repeats it elsewhere in that decree. And that was the first thing that came out because what was happening was that the American media was shaping the discussion in Rome, and it was telling people what to think about what was going on in Rome. And so the bishops were upset, and they came out with Intermerifica. All the Americans opposed Intermerifica. You're right, it has been suppressed. Nobody talks about it. This Father Aidan Nichols, a Dominican, wrote a book two, three years ago. I just got a copy of it, and he said that it's called something like the eight most important uh, documents of the Vatican II Council. Well, guess which one isn't in there? Intermerifica. <laughs> That's, that's well, not in there. In your uh, website, uh, the American Proposition, <clears throat> in the articles that I was reading that prepare for this, uh, you said there was four institutions that, in my words, I guess, pose a, a threat when they're corrupted. Oh, yeah. and, and you said the most, uh, the one that was m mostly concerning was the media and television theater and that because it's so powerful in the unconscious and this and that. Now, Intermerifica touches on that, right? Is that Intermerifica, it deals with the whole gamut, not just the news, but That's also right. theater, with the arts. With the arts. Deals and, with the media. The and this media. is interesting because this was Vatican II where the legions of decency and where, you know, when I grew up, you couldn't, certain movies, you're, if you watched it, you, it was a mortal sin. And then that ceased. Well, the Legion of Decency was this idea behind uh, th that had a lot of private actors engaged in it. They kind of agreed not to do certain things, right? And that manifested itself in the parish bulletins every Sunday. You know, we got a rating A to, I guess it was F, right, on the movies, which ones were good and which weren't. 
you know, morally objectionable, all that stuff. But that was a private um, agreement. And Intermerifica, uh, I'm sorry, yes, Intermerifica approves that. It says, that's a great idea. Yes, it's supporting it. it. Yes, paragraph 11, 10 and 11, this is a great idea. But paragraph 12 says, ah, but you know what? The state, the government, has an obligation to enforce the laws for morality and a good culture and to make sure the media doesn't get out of line. The state does. But that is not that was not in the minds of the founders, was it? Oh no. It was not in the minds of the founders, was it? Where Didn't Patrick Henry thought there should be a state church. And then he did not want to go to the Constitution because he smelled a rat. See, I'm wondering all that he was understanding. When uh, when the um, when well he understood a lot. I think the anti federalists understood what was happening. They were going to lose their power. And I know we've talked about that before, I think. The Articles of Confederation were more on the, the side the, of the Anti-Federalists. Absolutely. And the Constitution was on the side of the Federalists, which was a, an incredible change Basically, was it a names. takeover in your mind? It was, it was a... Because you, you wrote a secret... It, it was a restructuring of the society. It was the creation of a national government. It was the creation of a national society, which was going to predominate over all the other societies. But when they agreed that they would have this convention, they didn't agree to do that. In the beginning, no, they just wanted to to tweak the articles to make them a little bit better, and they came up with this whole new plan. It was a little bit of a betrayal to the original idea of let's have this convention. Well, you know what? Uh, the people uh, ratified it, didn't they? They ratified the betrayal. So what you had is it's interesting. You mentioned Patrick Henry because when the Articles of Con of Confederate, when the uh, the Articles of the Constitution, the Seven Articles, got to Virginia. And they had the debate there. Um, there was a big dispute over Article 6, Section 3, which dealt with no religious test for any offices, you know, president or any other offices. And the, the members of the delegation, the Virginia delegation in Virginia discussing this in 1788, said, well, if you, if you allow that, you're going to have all sorts of people run in your country. You're going to have pagans and heretics and Catholics and Jews, and you can't have that. That's what they were saying. Yeah. And they said, you know, we gotta have a we gotta have a religious test. And so um the US Constitution was a very big remaking of society from the top down. Started small at first, but cop kept getting bigger because of that supremacy clause. Because of that supremacy clause. Um Madison, um, if if you read his notes, there you know, the Constitutional Convention was was absolutely secret. There was no minutes kept. That's what I'm saying. It, there was it, it, nobody it was, was, it was a little bit of in. a coup d'état in the sense that it had that it had it was secretive. It was very secretive. Madison kept the, the minutes. The the minutes are, are are his notes. They're those are in his papers, and you can read it. And in June the sixth, it's in my article. June the sixth, seventeen eighty seven, he got up and he said, you know, the best way for the minority to control the majority is by the structure we put in place and the size of this thing. So this idea of the minority always controlling the majority was in the structure of this of this entity of this constitution. Yeah, which minority? Well, <laughs> it's going to be the minority who has the most resources. What was most on those guys' minds, Madison, um, Jefferson to a degree, and definitely Hamilton and Jay. What was on their mind was that you had the majority, which was the little guy, okay, taking control of the legislatures. Okay, and they were passing laws that had kept them from having to pay their debts, that were invalidating other debts, that were canceling contracts, and this was making business really difficult to handle. And so, what you talk when Madison was talking about the minority, he's talking about an economic and social minority. And so, what you have in the Constitution is a mix of, of social uh, classes in the different uh, parts of the government, and then you also have the, the issue of checks and balances. Because you always want to control the majority. Because if you have a majority, they're going to vote for their own. They're going to protect their own. Yeah, and so how do they protect themselves from that? By They, they have a cog in every wheel. You know, you got three branches of government, right? You got a courts that are unelected that can come up with these ideas like they did with Roe versus Wade. And it puts a check on the majority. So the majority, right. That's even right. though supposedly we're a democracy where, where the majority rules, we hear that. That's just a facade. That, that's eyewash. That's a facade. The will of the majority can be overturned anytime. You know, I, I heard an interview by, by Dugan 
uh, Alexander Dugan, he's a Russian and he's a thinker. And he made an interesting comment. His English is very bad, but, is it, but he made an interesting comment to one of the interviewers, I think it was on RT. And he said, um, you see in the West, democracy actually means the right of the minority to veto the majority. Um, I, I think that in liberal, Western liberal societies, the, the right of the minority, which is the social and economic elites, is there to veto the rights of the majority. This, this question has already it's come up before with us, but I, I like to always revisit it. So when Hamilton went back to his hometown in New York, from what I know, it's a historical account. Okay, the, 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 pre, the um, minister or the chaplain uh, approached Hamilton because he had seen the Constitution. And the chaplain was very upset. And he said, you guys uh, failed to acknowledge God. And Hamilton goes, oh, I guess we forgot. I mean, of course, it's a joke. I mean, of course he didn't forget. Hamilton was the banker, right? He was the money guy. And he, he pushed God out and elevated the money. Now, am I wrong? How, where am I wrong on that, perhaps? Well, and, well, well the, the U.S. Constitution is, is not about God. It's about power relationships. It, it's about power relationships. It, it's not about, about, about following anything. The way, the way they deal with the principles that are supposed to underlie this society is they just have different competing interests. Fight it out. That's all. But then you don't have any state church, and you don't have any, uh, like Intermerfica said, that the state has to come in there and give some kind of moral guidance. That's well, not possible under it, our Constitution. No, the First Amendment, this is the brilliance of the First Amendment. The First Amendment cut out all the churches from really shaping and controlling society. We've talked about this before. But it also, too, I realize the more I, I, I think about this, the more I study the Constitution, I realize what, what the First Amendment does is it hopelessly fractionalizes people because it allows everybody a podium. Some podiums are bigger than others, but it allows everybody their opinion, whether it's religious, whether it's uh, political, whether it's, it is um, entertainment, whatever it may be, it allows everybody their own opinion. And that's how you fractionalize society and you break up the majority. I guess for the average person who has a family, uh, his only concern on a, you know, on the realistic level where people live, you know, you grew up in Lafayette, you had a, you had a really good family in a way. And what concerned your parents was how were they able to raise a good family? Well, this puts pressure in my mind, particularly on the father's role of disciplining and commanding his household, because the government can kind of oversee that and impose its, Amorality. I mean, it, it can impose its rules on you, but but on what basis if they don't have a moral compass? Well, they they can do it by power, by by the written constitution. And what's to by protect the written, you written as written laws? What's to protect you as you're trying to just? Well, you hope other principles are out there, and there are other interests out there that are interested in protecting you, but you don't really have much of a of help of a church protecting you. Um, do you? I mean, the, the church is going to basically say, well, it's a civil matter and let you do what you have to do. But what you deal with, a lot of times, you deal with everybody's got their opinion, everybody's got their viewpoint. So, you know, right before I came over here, somebody tagged me uh, on, on Facebook, you know, and, and the way that works is your name gets tagged, a little thing shows up on this little bell. And so you look at the little bell and you say, oh, there's my name, and what's this about? And I see that there is a post there that references an article that has my name in it. So I went and I looked at that article, and that article is from LifeSite News, and it's by Dr. Makey Hickson. She wrote a uh, a piece um, in, um, in in I think it was May 14th. It was May 14th, this past Friday. She wrote it because uh, I went and I read it, and she is she wrote a piece critiquing a piece by Robert Moynihan, who writes a blog, you know, he's got, every Catholic has their blog, uh, writes a blog with their own opinion, uh, writes a blog, and he was writing about Vatican II, and about how time life, you know, affected Vatican II, and Robert Blair Kaiser was involved. Well, anyways, Hickson quotes my book and says, you know, the government was working with Luce to bring in some of the, um, uh, liberal capital L doctrines of America into the church. 
Well, I, this is huge. I mean, the fact that this is out there now in such a publication as LifeSite News is huge. But, but it goes to show that everybody kind of has their opinion. And what, what's kind of interesting is a lot of, of the chatters pursue their own personal agenda for whatever reason. Because I talked to Robert Moynihan. I talked to him in August of last year. He contacted me. He said, I hear you got this book out. I said, yeah. And he got the book. He said, well, that's a big book. It'll take me a long time to read it. I said, no, you can read it fast. I said, you know what? And so um, I, we talked for a while. I told him what Kaiser told me. Robert Blair Kaiser talked to me before he died. I talked to him twice in the summer of 09 and the summer of 10. And, um, you know, Kaiser told me that everybody at time knew this was a conspiracy to basically try to subvert Catholic doctrine. Now, they didn't do it, but the Catholic leadership seemed to think so. But, you know, you don't need the Catholic leadership. You just need the doctrine of God and one person who believes. And that's all you need. And so uh, this is what I told Moynihan. And so, you know, I was looking the other day. It's like, here we are, nine months later. I haven't heard anything from him. So he finally publishes a letter, you know, his, his article, and he doesn't even mention my book. <laughs> so everybody's got their own agenda, you know, for what they want to say and why they want to say it. And this is the value of the Catholic leadership. You know, they can sit in there and kind of pull people together, keep people on the same track, you know, keep them focused on what's important. And the most important issue of the day is the system a social organization. This is the biggest issue of the day. I mean, every, they're talking about overturning Roe versus Wade. I mean, are, are you kidding? You really think that's going to happen, Peter, with this decision, this Dobbs decision out of Mississippi? Do you, do you think they're going to overturn Roe versus Wade? Well, they're singling out a very important aspect of Roe versus Wade. I and agree. If they, and if they get that leverage in, right, and the Supreme Court does overturn that particular point, that's the crux of the matter in a way. Well, if they allow in place abortions up to 15 weeks, that's most abortions. That's 90% of the abortions. If they allow that in place, you know, um, and they get rid of, and they allow states to ban everything over 15 weeks in a certain way, well, what have they just done? They they have allowed both sides to sort of live in America. It's kind of a modus vivendi to a point, though I think the left is not going to like even that. But they may have to live with it. But they're going to have to live with it. But then is the Supreme Court going to be afraid of violence? I'm also interested, when they passed Roe versus Wade in 1973, it was a whole different dynamic going on at the time. First oh, of all, yeah. you still had the... Uh, Ehrlich, Ehrlich, Ehrlich's book, I'm not saying his name right, you know, Population Explosion. Yep. All right. And people were scared to death because they believed it. It was on all the college campuses. Oh, yeah. Everybody was believing that by the year 2000, we're going to die by overpopulation. Yeah. Right. Okay. So this was, I mean, people were panicking. What can we do? And that was fueling a lot of people's emotions. We don't have that panic going on right now. No, I, I but what you have in is decline in population. You're having, yeah, you're I'm having just saying, a isn't, is this a reaction? You're, you're, you're having 1.7. 1. Yeah. 1. I mean, you're losing people. You're having a concentration of wealth, uh, which is just unprecedented in, in U.S. history. Um, and the pandemic concentrated it further. Um, and so what you're seeing are a lot of actually social evils that are coming to the fore as a result of this system of social organization. And what are Catholics supposed to do? Well, John Cardinal Wright wrote in his doctoral thesis, which received denial in obstat and imprimatur, he said, it is the highest form of patriotism to Catholicize one's fatherland. The highest form of patriotism. And he cited to the papal teachings on that regard, which means you have to not just convert people, but, but the system has to be based on the divine positive law, on the moral order. That is what we're called to do. That's the most important thing. And he said, the way Catholics best do that is by unity. Well, you don't have unity, right? You don't have unity. Mm, this is it's probably the least amount of unity we've had in a long time. It probably it? is, but the leadership is not is not there to unite people. They they're allowing the church to function like a mini America, and the whole idea of America was to control the majority so the minority, who are the socioeconomic elites, can benefit. That's and you call them plutocrats. I call them plutocrats because plutoc the very term of plutocrat means. That these are wealthy people, not necessarily in government, but they're wealthy people who use the system to their advantage and who are able to turn the system to their advantage. And that's definitely the case in America. Now, it doesn't mean that they're the only ones who benefit, but they are the primary ones who benefit. This is something Charles Beard made very clear in 1913. 
you know, the guys who wrote the Constitution, who benefit from the Constitution, they, they don't have to do everything to the exclusion of everyone else. They just have to give themselves a little bit of a benefit over everyone else. And they got the smarts and they got the contacts and they got the drive and they can be somebody. And even Catholic writers can be somebody, apparently, in America. At okay. what price? No. Okay, what do you think of, uh, uh, I've been <clears throat> following these, um, the word gold, uh, that person's a gold digger, okay, and they're following, like, there's scams on dating sites. Beware of, you know, if you marry this oh, girl, it's a scam. And they're, they're zeroing in on this motivation that they're, oh, re sure. they're really about the money. Yeah. Watch out. They're really about the money. And you got to, and so yeah. tons of energy are being yeah. screen out these yeah. people that yeah. are really about the money. Yeah. Well, we're not putting that kind of scrutiny on the founders. We're not putting that kind of scrutiny uh, in other places. All, all of the, there, there was a whole bunch of constitutional authorities in the 60s and 70s who really, they could not refute um, what Beard said. They knew there was an economic basis, an economic component to the Constitution. If you look at any event, any transaction, any document, and you don't understand the economic dynamics involved, and you don't know those dynamics, you don't know what's going on. But see, that's a nice, nice word, because you, you could shift those words and then call them gold diggers. Well, sure. I'm just saying. No, the women are gold These diggers. These other people are called gold many, diggers. Many women are gold diggers now. Absolutely they are. Because money defines your value and defines your success and defines how good of a life and but it, it provides security. But if the founders were, in a sense, gold diggers, but we use, we use different terms, but, but it was still love of money beyond what Christianity would allow. They needed to create a strong central government that allowed for capital markets, that allowed for a large market, unhindered market, that allowed for a strong army and a navy to repel any aggressors and to take territory. They saw a lot of territory going out west. What the founders were dealing with is this desire, they call it democracy, this desire for people, you know, to run things themselves. Because what you had in America from early days was you had a tension between the little guy and the big guy. And you always say, well, that's in every society. Well, it was different in America because America was a brand new society. You had people taming the frontier. <laughs> Excuse me. You had guys and gals going out into the wilderness and chopping down wood. And they had to have their own economic means of, of uh, self you know, fulfillment, economic means to do what they needed, to get what they needed. And so you had a lot of economic power in society being decentralized. The crown was pulling back against that. And there were the elites in the count in the colonies, the elites in the colonies wanted to control the economy. And the flashpoint was the currency. It's always the currency. Okay. That was the flashpoint of really of, of the revolution. And because the little guys were being starved of currency, so they had to barter. Well, barter really slows you down. And the idea of controlling the currency from London is that you can control trade and commerce and you don't have um, runaway inflation. But there was such a, a demand, there was so much economic activity, they needed the money in the colonies. All, all, all the historians write about this. And you have to understand that to understand the revolution. And so the Americans were, they, they, they got to a point, and John Adams writes about this, where they got to a point where when the revolution started, what did the king do? He shut down all of his courts, closed all the courts. All the little guys went up to John Adams and said, thank you, Mr. Adams. Thank you. They've shut the courts. They can't haul us into court for not paying our debts. You know? Yeah, because you had debtor prison and all that. Yeah. Debtor prison and all that. So what you had was the little guy felt empowered and they understood uh, in the legislature they could vote themselves a lot of paper money and keep things going. Now that ran into problems with inflation and stuff like that. And that and inflation in those days weakened uh, a lot of economic interest. They didn't want to get weakened. So uh, you had really this struggle, you know, between two different competing economic systems you had the mercantilist system, which the King of England was head of and his government. And you had a more of a capitalistic system that, that the Americans had, which was more decentralized. It was just more of a decentralized system where you had smaller actors making decisions. 
smaller banks trying to come up after independence. And that really fueled a great deal of American economic wealth and development. And I was listening to Professor Richard Werner the other day, and he said, you know, in 1976, when Mao died in China, Deng Xiaoping, first thing he did is study the American banking system, because the American banking system at the time was decentralized. And so what the Americans did is largely through decentralization. What the Germans have done is through the decentralization of their banks and community banks, which are able for people to work and produce things of value and not just get tied up in ridiculous uh, buying of assets and, and equities and bonds and stuff like that. But you actually borrow money to create things that then create more value and make more money and bring more prosperity to society. So this is what Deng Xiaoping saw, and that's what he copied in China. And in America today, I know we're kind of getting off the track, but in America today, what you're seeing is, is the consolidation of banking power and the collapse of the smaller banks. That's a big fight in America now. It's a big fight in Europe. And, it's, and according to the Chinese, uh, that would seem to be a losing fight because he seems to be attracted to the decentralization, that that works better. Uh, who is that? The leader of China. He seems to be uh, in favor of decentralization, but at the same time, the Chinese Communist Party runs the show. True, but, but he's still attracted, he wasn't attracted to the consolidation. No, he wants to encourage economic growth. See, Russia, the Soviet Union had one bank. <laughs> that was the central bank, okay? And it just didn't work. No. They, they fell apart after a while. So you have to have money that's available that people can have. Um, because you don't want to have to take, you know, a ton of tobacco, you know, to get enough wood to build your cabin. Okay, it just it just doesn't work very well. So what they did in in uh, in America is they wrote out pieces of paper. This represents a ton of tobacco. So they started passing this script back around, and it worked because Americans are ingenious because because Americans have had to deal with the frontier and that mentality of making things work and being practical has stayed with us to this day. Uh, let me, uh, get back to that, that issue. Um, that is part of the American character. Let's, let's, let, let, American let's attack, character. let's attack American, uh, the, the, the plutocrats. Okay. And the fact that we, we really, we really admire the plutocrats because everybody knows the famous scripture that the love of money is the root of all evil. Okay. But that's in the context where it's talking about the, like the major false doctrine, you know, that, uh, if, if the slave does not consider his master worthy of all honor, then, then the name of God and his doctrine is being blasphemed. Well, it's interesting that immediately goes into describing these people that promote that, and it concludes by saying these people suppose that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. And then he goes into having, but, and having food and raiment, let us be there, there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The point I'm saying is that the, the scripture is saying, with food and clothing, we're to be content. And when you are emphasizing success, gain is godliness, that having more than what you need becomes its own religion. I mean, it, it takes on a life of its own. And so success now is material prosperity, but how is that good for the soul? Well, um, everything to excess is bad. So, you know, that's where the church can, uh, comes in or some higher principles come in to modulate, you know, your, your desires and your appetites for things to control your pride and to do things for the right purpose, for the right objective, in the right circumstances. But we don't see the church stepping in. And, and so we no, have people I, that are plutocrats, they're billionaire billionaires, and we admire that, and yet it's destructive of their own soul. Success is admired in America. There's no doubt about that. And Pope Pius IX in 1864 said, you either serve God or you serve wealth in, in any society. That's a decision you make. And, and that's the biggest issue any group of people have to make. It's the biggest issue confronting the Americans right now. How are we going to organize society? But Alexander Hamilton is being confronted by the chaplain. And in a way, 
by, by, by not acknowledging God in the Constitution, he's saying we're going to serve well. We're going to yeah, serve commercial I, I interests. I think that's, that's correct. We're going to serve the wealth and the wealthy. That's, that's correct. Because clearly the, the plutocrats were given a leg up with the Constitution. That was clearly the intent of Hamilton and Madison. Uh, I mean, Hamilton and Madison had kind of a little different take on what the economic structure would be like, but they both agreed the plutocrats would be the ones who should rule. They're the minority. Which means money should rule. Money interests should rule. Effectively, yes. Everything is de delineated in terms of money. And how many followers you might have and how many clicks of like you get onto YouTube. So let's hope you get a lot of clicks on this. And Patrick Henry, I think, because he was quite the religious man. I mean, he was, he was a dis uh, in the dissenting crowd, but he was very religious. And that's why he promoted a state church, because he saw if there's no checks on the money interest morally, if the church can't step in and f with its full force of freedom from the state church, uh, check this. He saw this is just going to yeah. turn into an empire. Well, he was right. Well, they used the word empire in Federalist One. They used the word. This is an empire. That is not what Patrick Henry wanted at all. No, it's not what he wanted. That's not what he wanted. He wanted a more decentralized, agrarian type of, of situation. But the state church checks the government but it also checks the appetites of, of private individuals. This is what is in my book, one of the themes in my book. Everybody understood that. If you have a state church, especially the Catholic church, they're going to control the rich people. Now the rich will try to control the Catholic church too. We know that. We see that. Okay. But still, that's one more thing the rich have to do, <laughs> you know, to keep, um, to keep themselves uh, in charge of things. They have to work harder at controlling the church. Now, in the First Amendment, it's easy for them to control the church. Okay, now, uh, the half an hour is up here. Um, is there any chance, of, like what we've just been talking to about the Constitution, but do you have any time to, like, put this together with the case in Mississippi? You know, the abortion, does this at all come together? Um, well, I think, you know, you're, you're dealing here um, with this case in Mississippi that is being blown out of proportion. Um, and, you know, what you're ultimately talking about is uh, the basis of the policies that are supposed to run the society. If you had a divine positive law, you wouldn't be dealing with abortions up to 15 weeks or cutting them off after 15 weeks. Um, what's going to be really interesting to see if the six Catholic justices on the Supreme Court are going to follow their Catholic consciences and, and vote at least the right way on this and stop abortions after 15 weeks. That's better than not stopping them. Um, so, and let's see if they'll mention their religion in the decision. Do you think behind, uh, in a sense, behind the right for an abortion is a notion, I have a right for economic advancement? Oh, absolutely. That, that was clearly there. And that, that's, that's clearly in the decisions. Uh, that's that's Casey versus Planned Parenthood from 1992. This is this is economic. You're you're talking about a continuation of radical individualism with 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 abortion, and you know that is really what is part and parcel of the Constitution is this idea of the individual, and the individual. Um, the Constitution set up a a political economy, as I've said before, which really maximizes the individual. Um, and despite that, you have the natural law coming up in America, trying to form groups of people. And you, you always have this ideology of liberalism, capital L, fighting the natural law in America. They're, all, they're always at odds. They're, they're always fighting. This is, this is the, the struggle in America all throughout history. Sometimes the natural law has been on the, on the, on the grassroots, you know, with the anti-federalists more so than with the federalists. And they're just kind of struggling with each other. You know, and you see bits of the natural law with the pro-lifers, with the pro-gun people, um, you know, with some of the, with some of the economic people. You know, you see these these aspects. You know, the traditional value people. You see these aspects of the natural law coming together to oppose this ideology and its natural conclusions. Okay, which law, particular law of the natural law, is is this abortion the Mississippi case? What's it touching on? Which, well, part, which part of the natural law? Well, St. Thomas Aquinas, I believe in uh, 
Summa Theolo it was a Summa Theological Summa Theologica, I'm sorry, part uh part two, part one, I believe it was two one. Uh he mentions uh the natural law and he says in the natural law you get the right to self preservation. Uh, you got the right to procreation, the right to raise your family, the right to culture, and the right to worship God. And and that last one, uh, in a society, as a society, that last one was was identified also by Monsignor Shea in the 1950s when he was fighting John Courtney Murray. So that's part of the natural law. It's part of human history. So those are the five things. So so when you're talking about about destroying your progeny, you know, you're talking about destroying your offspring. You're in a way, what you're really doing is you are destroying your ability to procreate uh, because your children are being aborted. So that's against the natural law. You're also destroying any any sense of self-preservation as a people because not only do you have an individual right to self-preservation, but you have a right to preservation as a people. Uh, and so these things are what are what's under attack with abortion. Abortion's a weapon, just like contraception's a weapon. Every, everybody knows this, uh, or everybody should know it, uh, and it's been used to destroy again the majority I and mean, targeted you know against certain elements of the society especially the christians the catholics uh, and um, to keep people from having any sort of unity and, and any sort of, of pride okay do you think uh the purpose of marriage for Catholics is a little bit different than the purpose of marriage for protestants on, on a couple issues okay the catholics emphasize that um uh marital uh duty you know your sexual duty is aiming at mostly for procreation the the, pur the purpose of having sex in marriage is more along the lines for procreation where the protestants might say it's more for sexual um well, pleasure, pleasure or however you want to say it but well, but but the catholics that would put if it's for procreation that would make the Catholics more anti-abortion. That makes sense, yeah. The Catholics say marriage is for procreation and, and unity of value. That's the Catholic doctrine as I understand it. Right, so if it is for procreation to a high degree, then abortion is, is like, <laughs> it, it's so evil because why are you even getting married? Well, it, it goes to the idea that you have a responsibility to protect your own, too. You have a right to defend your own people. I, I mean, look, they, they use, look, Nazi Germany used abortion. Soviet Union used abortion. Um, I mean, there, there are other examples out there. Every, every tyrannical regime uses abortion. In America, it's called a right. <laughs> and it serves, you know, the plutocrats because it reduces the population. The plutocrats don't like a big population. They want a small population. They've always wanted that because that allows for the concentration of wealth. And they want to concentrate wealth. And again, this is the struggle in America from day one. You know, the struggle of wealth versus the natural law this, or some idea of the natural law or some idea of God's law. It's always this struggle with this ideology. And it's also interesting that it's coming from Mississippi. Okay. And Mississippi is notorious, in my mind, along with North Carolina, is from my all, my personal experience talking to people, as the two most religious states. So here, so here's Mississippi. They always were the first ones to defend prayer in school. But it's also like number fifty and being poor, number fifty and being having the worst schools, you know, all that. It's just it's just interesting that the poor are rich in faith. So here's right. a state that's right that, that has more true. faith, but they don't right. have the success materially. That's that's right. The poor are always are richer in the faith, uh, and, be, and they know they have each other more than anything. But there is a very real push to outlaw abortions. We saw it in Idaho. We saw it in um, Texas. I mean, the red state leadership understands this is an important issue. And um, I mean, yeah, you got people with a lot of different religions and no religion, but I mean, you, what you have is a lot of people who, who can understand that, you know, we hold some aspect of this natural law, and we can put all these little sticks together, and we're naturally allied for some reason, because we have some sense, you know, that it's it's bigger than what the plutocrats want. That's really what you're dealing with. You're dealing with people in the red states that are saying, it's really bigger than what the plutocrats want. It really is. 
and and they grab onto some aspect of the natural law, and they need to all come together, bring their twigs together, and hold them together, and unite together, and say, we've had enough, it's time to change. No to tyranny, no to the plutocrats. No, for a lot of people, and maybe I'm one of them, <clears throat> There's this fear that you, you see this push by the Biden administration in the connection with China, and it's like, whoa, are we on a communist blitzkrieg trying to overtake us? You know, it's kind of, you know, and is this a pushback against that? You know, with the plutocrats kind of have this agenda. Well, let's just kind of be like China. Let's kind of, let's have a system like theirs. Well, well, the plutocrats will work with whoever to to get what they want to control populations, and so you know they'll work with the Chinese. It'll be love hate type thing. You know, uh, right now they don't like Russia, but they'll let stuff out, you know, about how we don't like the Chinese and the Chinese are the threat. But, you know, that's the government saying it, but the plutocrats are working on another level with the Chinese government. Well, they had Bloomberg, it was it Bloomberg, they right. have all this evidence that he's been in cahoots with the Chinese for right. years. Oh, yeah, Michael Blue, oh, sure, absolutely, absolutely. Basically selling us out. Well, yeah, they, they're they interested in their in their wallets. That's what they're interested in. They care about three three things. Their bellies, their wallets, and you know what the third one is? Yeah, Nelson Rockefeller. Yeah, it's their sex organ. Those are the three things that, that the plutocrats care about. And they don't really care about anything else. And so they'll, they'll make deals with anybody and everybody else to keep that going because the, the wealth takes on a life of its own in their life. And they want to bring everybody else into that service. And that's the whole idea behind masks. And um, that's a form of social signaling. That's this guy, Martin. He wrote a piece that was on Zero Hedge. He says that's a part of, of social virtue signaling. You wear a mask. And so, the, you know, the, the media and also to, you know, the corporations get on board and they tell you what they expect you to do if you want to be with the winners. You know, you got to put on the mask, you got to social distance, or you got to get the vaccine. And if you get the vaccine, then, you could, then you're free. You can be with your friends. You don't have to wear a mask, you know. Um, so this is what I think people instinctively are picking up and resenting. And when the president or the putative president of the United States tweets, you know, it's a mask or vax, well, that's, that's, that's a need it. Okay. And that's troubling because, um, a, a lot of people question rightfully so the lethality of this disease, having lived a year on and watched it progress. It's just a fraction of what they told us it was at the beginning. Mm -hmm. There is a disease. It is deadly if, if to certain people. Right. It is. But it's but, not 40 to 50 times greater than no, your average flu is how no. they were portraying it in the beginning. Right. And so what's happened now is the government has lost all this credibility as a result of this. And so you're seeing people push back against the plutocrats saying, we don't want to wear the masks anymore. This is an inconvenience and muzzles us. We don't want a vaccine that, that right now is just simply experimental. I mean, you look at the CDC's website, you read the CDC's website, and they admit, we don't have any long-term data on the effects of this vaccine. Wow. So you're in a test group. If you get the, if you get it, you're in a test group. And maybe you're going to lose this video now. How's that? Because I said something against the vaccine. Well, we'll edit it. Yeah, I guess you're going to have to edit it. <laughs> but... Yeah. But it is, it is important, but let's, let's get back to the state church idea. In other words, uh, so people are supposed to be, when we grew up in the 50s, I mean, everybody went to church, okay? And everybody so you, went to you, church. You formed everybody your identity there, you, you stuck, tuck, you, you were tight to it, and it could be it was just forms, or it could have been, you know, you were really in your heart doing it. But it protected you from the false religions that were out there. And the state has a potential of always being a false religion. They can always impose. That's right. And, and in a sense, what we're talking about is that the whole mask and the vaccine, that whole thing, without getting super critical of, you know, of violating some terms of uh, YouTube or something. <laughs> but we don't need to go there. In other words, we're just saying this is an ersatz. This is, this is a replacement. Well, this is, what, this is what you saw with Everson and Engel versus Vitale. You saw those two Supreme Court cases that cut people off from religion in the public sphere in the most important place, the school, where people came together. Religion was cut out. So, so you couldn't have religion. So you broke a bond and you made people more easily malleable and controllable by the powerful who could set the message in society. That's what you did. 
I mean, these, this, this is a design. What was it in the Declaration of Independence? A design to subdue, you know, the people of America? Yeah, I mean, I see it like in the military, World War II, I see a lot of social engineering there. <clears throat> and I see the, the pushing down of religion and politics to be the front and center and the elevating of maybe I could call it the Masonic phallic religion. Sex became a dominant theme. And by taking prayer and Bible out of school and all that, well, then what do you think? It was the Masonic phallic religion that came in. And now sex is what is going to take over. Well, I, you know, you got the, there's a lot of ideas, which you have is the, is the elevation of liberalism as, a, as an ideology. This is the best way to organize it, because at the root, we're all created equal. And, and Biden said this in a joint address to Congress. We're all created equal. Well, every time you hear, we're all created equal, hold on. Because that idea, I mean, hold on to your wallets, hold on to your friends and neighbors, because that idea is always announced right before there's a war. <laughs> You know, it was a war in 1776. There was a war in 1863. And they're getting ready to do a war against somebody else in this society right now. When they start talking, all men are created equal. They're getting ready to do something. Okay, what do you think? Because you have military. Well, Well, you're, you're seeing this whole idea of critical race theory. You're seeing the deconstruction, again, of the majority in America. The majority in America are what they call white people, okay? people with skin kind of our color, okay? But it's not just that. It's other things. It, there is a cultural identity. There is a is a, a, an ethnic identity, okay? It's, it's, and in my articles, I talk about what a culture is from an anthropological point of view. And, and even, uh, even the priests and the popes talk about characteristics and character of people. And that, and that genetics and DNA is an aspect of that. It's not the controlling, but it is an aspect. And everybody knows this, okay? And to say otherwise is 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 wrong. Um, it's just wrong. So so what you have is you have this majority, which you know look like us, which was based on a on a on a on a, an English, you know, Scottish uh, platform culturally, which which was some adaptations, and then you know it was able to assimilate people, and some people were not assimilated; they just couldn't fit in. But people were able to, Catholics were able to assimilate. A lot of people were able to assimilate and, and, to, and to do well and make good. And as we were growing up, you know, this was the cowboy. This was John Wayne. We've talked about this before. This was John Wayne. This is the cowboy. This is what Hollywood, Hollywood puts them up and Hollywood takes them down. And then, you know, we had these, these programs like, you know, the family programs, Leave it to Beaver, these other programs. Oh, great. You know, the nuclear family is great and wonderful. And then gradually they got away from that, you know. It was different family combinations, like the Brady Bunch. And then after that, it's like, oh, you got all these problems in the nuclear families with all the sitcoms that come out in the 70s. Then they started elevating everything, you know, that was dysfunctional and perverted. And I mean, it just goes on this continuum till to now, you know, if you are uh, of a certain ethnic group in America, you're, you're a target. You're simply a target. And if you hold a certain viewpoints, and if you are heterosexual and you have a nuclear family, you're targeted. You're in the minority. You're 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 the majority, but you're targeted, and they're going to uh, they're going to get you. And once again, you know, it's using the structure and the size of the Constitution, as Madison said, to target the minor the majority, so the majority don't start making rules to benefit the majority at the expense of the plutocrats. That's the whole idea here, folks. Well, and like you said. <clears throat> They, they got to prevent the majority from finding some way to unify. They and, got to. And what we had was there was a way to unify by get, gathering around Trump. And I'm not defending Trump. I'm no, not saying he's good or bad. But I'm saying it's, it's, a, it's addressing that if the majority can unify on anything, right. that's a threat. That's correct. It is a threat. So they, that's so it, it, they could not unite on, well, we're white. But they could unite on, I think we're all Packers fans. You know, right. but but if they did unite, that becomes the threat to the minority. That becomes a threat to the minority, and then the minority and the plutocrats are told what they have to do, and the laws are passed for the majority. And this was not lost on the founders. They saw all these little nobodies in the state legislatures legislating potentially away their profits, if not their fortunes. Okay, and they knew, oh my God, we got a principle here. There's a majority. There's a minority. How do we control them? Ah, got an idea. 
Let's come up with the structure of government at the national level. And that, that was the brilliance of Madison and Hamilton. And they, and they were, they were brilliant men. Absolutely brilliant. I take nothing away from them. And what was the significance with Lincoln <clears throat> winning the war and then that reducing the authority of the state constitution and the states? Well, what, what was that in light of the big picture in, in 1776 or 1789, you know, when they wrote the constitution? They set that in motion. The Southerners uh, uh, saw the trap. I mean, you know, it was too late. They, they, you know, they realized too late that they were trapped. They couldn't get out. And then Lincoln really centralized this and put the U.S. Constitution directly over the state so they couldn't do it again. Well, the, the issue of secession was always an open issue. That was always an open issue. I mean, you had the North wanted to succeed at one point. Oh, yeah. Some, some people out in the West wanted to secede, you know, the South. Everybody, at some point or another, they wanted to secede, you know. But that finally resolved that issue. Nobody's going to secede. Nobody's out of, nobody gets out of here. <laughs> nobody gets out of this room. We need a big market, okay? Yeah. And we're all equal. That's your political economy, okay? That means you can, you can market to everyone. But despite that, you still had communities grow up. Despite that, you had the whites in the South you know, work a deal to push out the Yankees and to take control of their states as much as they could. So you still had the rise of, of communities and of groups. And you're seeing the rise of communities, especially in big tech and high tech now, where they're trying to monetize communities, but they're creating these communities of interest, these faux communities, because I like, you know, bottled water or whatever, or I like this game, or I like playing, you know, it's big in the in the whole game bit. It's in the whole, um, you know, like uh, all those different online games you can play now. You can trade pieces and bits of the players back and forth. And I don't know all of them. Fortnite is one of them, but these are big. And this is getting the new communities. All the young kids are in this. The new, this is the new community. And they don't even see who they're playing against. They don't even know who they are. I mean, I guess at some point you pick up the phone and call them if they do that. But, but you've got these brand new manufactured communities. So, so what you've seen the plutocrats do is instead of letting the natural law work, we're going to create the communities. Right. And, and it used to be, <clears throat> like in Indiana, uh, you had public schools that were supposedly number one, their, their number one purpose was to, in, their, in the words of the Constitution of Indiana, to, en to encourage by all suitable means moral improvement. Uh, and so the schools were going to be like a little quasi-state church in that, that they were going to miraculously promote moral improvement. But with, with Lincoln winning the war and the U.S. Constitution, you know, it just overrules that mission of the school. With the U.S. Constitution being the highest authority, this, Indiana schools, are, they're, they're helpless to fulfill the mission well, you, encouraging moral improvement. Well, you've had the firsthand experience on that. You're the expert on that. Yeah. So we just spent $225 million in a referendum. I mean, the referendum was to, was to take $225 million from the citizens to pour it into the public schools. And they did it in the height of the COVID when no one's going out to vote. So it was kind of like a trick move. But are we going to get moral improvement? I mean, what do people worry about the most in South Bend? And why did they move out of South Bend? Well, obviously, because of crime, because your wife, uh, if she doesn't feel safe, you're going to have to move, okay? Yeah, you want to be safe. That's what government's supposed to do, protect people and unify people. Well, how are you going to be safe if the schools are not doing moral improvement? And in fact, maybe they're going backwards, and now crime is going up in your community, and your wife does not feel safe. Well, you've been in South Bend, what, 30, 40 years now. Um, how's it been? How's it? How's it? progressed over time? Well, everybody knows it's getting a lot worse. Do you think it's getting worse? Everybody feels it is. Well, so in other words, the students, the students coming out of, uh, of our moral improvement centers, <laughs> which is what they are. MICs. They are moral improvement centers, according to the Constitution of Indiana. They don't see that moral improvement is taking place. In fact, they feel they're coming out significantly less moral. I mean, they're not, their morals are not improving, they're decreasing. And yet that's supposed to be a moral improvement center. So what is, what are these schools? What are they? Are they a mystery? What, what do you think they are? I think, uh, <laughs> you don't want to hear what people that are high up that are in the know on that say. And it's not very flattering, okay? 
it's not there. It, it's, it's, it's so far from moral improvement that it's shocking. Okay, this is a disaster. And, we're, and we keep feeding this thing without any reflection. And yet schools are supposed to be a place for reflection. Well, the work is cut out for the Catholics. Now the leadership just has to get its act together. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I mean, from the Catholic point of view, the Catholic schools, well, that's where everybody wants to send their kids because they feel there will be moral improvement because every good parent has it as their highest thought to have their children be moral. That's their goal. I mean, the purpose of marriage, uh, and what, Malachi 2.15, uh, purpose of marriage is to produce a godly seed. Well, the natural law speaks to the parents and tells them that, yeah, that's probably true. Yeah. You know, I have a duty to raise my children. Yeah, that's part of the natural law, duty to raise your children. And raise them to be godly in some fashion. Yeah, and to live in a culture, right? It's all tied together. St. Thomas Aquinas made it very clear. Summa Theologica. Yeah, and if, and if you're putting, everybody's pouring half their property tax into these schools and they're not getting moral improvement. In fact, it's boomeranging on them. On them. You think somebody's a, a little bit distraught? I would say so. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I suppose our system of law, and that's another whole other subject, which you did address in your article. Uh, I, I know we're coming down to the, to the end. I just yeah. want to say, read the American Proposition. Okay. We've got new stuff coming up all the time, working okay. on a couple of other publications, so stay tuned. Okay. I think this is the biggest issue of our time, is social organization. I think it's starting to bubble up. And, and you know, they just had Sorhav Amari... Uh, the New York Post, one of the editorial guys, he's talking about traditional societies. He was on, he was on, you know, EWTN. Okay, great. You know, I, I know there are problems with EWTN. There are problems with every Catholic, you know, but at least the issue is now starting to be how, how do we look at organizing society? Because we're seeing the societal collapse that you're talking about. So read the American Proposition. Okay. Uh, this is Citizens for Community Media. Peter Helen with David Wimhoff.